Hello everyone, welcome to yet another experience uh, sharing uh, sessions by PyLadies India and this uh, session would be on PhD and the many possibilities ahead. We have with us Ananya Mandal. So Ananya is a PhD, uh, Ananya is currently pursuing her PhD at Ludwig Maximilians University in uh, Munich, Germany in the area of human cognitive neuroscience. She aims to better understand multisensory spatial attention in humans with the help of controlled experiments uh, conducted inside virtual reality using spatial auditory and visual stimuli. Before joining her PhD, she did her master's in neural and cognitive sciences at the University of Hyderabad after completing a bachelor's uh, in statistics from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. Welcome, Ananya. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for host thanks for conducting this experience sharing session. Uh, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so today, as mentioned by Sakanya, I'll be talking about PhD and the many opportunities ahead. Now, before going to the many opportunities, let's look at what a PhD is. So, as you all know, it is. Uh, short for Doctor of Philosophy, and it is the highest academic degree that one can attain. And it normally takes around three to five years of full-time scholarship and research work towards a thesis, um, resulting in an original contribution to the subject. Now, these were all very factual information that I gave you. To better understand what a PhD exactly is, I would use this uh, very famous illustration by Professor Matt Might, uh, who like uh, shows uh, P and like if you can see this black circle here, that's all of human knowledge. And throughout our uh, schooling, say secondary and primary school, we gain some amount of knowledge in all fields, which becomes a bit narrower with our bachelor's and master's degree. Now with the PhD, it reaches the tip of this human knowledge and in the end creates this small dent which is your original contribution towards the field. So if you just think about it, it's amazing that you actually pull the um, human knowledge to its extreme and add something to it with your PhD. So with this thought, let's move forward to looking at what it is exactly like doing a PhD. If you go through the internet and search what is it like doing a PhD, you might come across infographics like this which very nicely shows the step-by-step -step, uh, progression of what a research process is. And it generally starts with defining a research problem, followed by reviewing the literature to see what is done and what is left to be done in the field. And uh, then again, followed by uh, selecting a research design and formulating a hypothesis, after which carrying out the actual research, collecting data, and interpreting those results. And after all these steps, you report the results and publish it in the form of research articles. Now, if you think about it, it looks very simple just to follow the steps one by one and you'll be done by it. But in my personal experience and in the experience of a lot of other PhD students, research seldom is like that. And to think, like to think about it, it wouldn't be as fun if it were just a straight uh, road. It's often a very hilly terrain where you have to traverse through uh, hilly regions and overcome a lot of failures. And that in itself is probably the essence of what a PhD is because you are searching for something which no one has ever looked for. And therefore you're bound to face failures and also overcome from those failures. Now I'd like to uh, tell you some of the transferable skills from a PhD that you might gain. And these skills that I'll mention are universal to any PhD you do in any discipline, be it an engineering PhD, a computer science, a neuroscience, or even sociology or economics PhD. So these are the so-called soft skills which you will gain and which you can actually um, transfer it to any other career that you um, carry on after your PhD. The first most important is time management. Now, while doing your PhD, you will just not be conducting your research project. Along with your research project, you'll also be teaching 
taking courses, uh, writing up reports, publishing, uh, communicating your research at conferences, and all these takes time. So at the end of your PhD, you can really be assured that you'll become a master in time management. Next is project management. Uh, seldom it happens that uh, a PhD student just you know, handles one project. It's often a lot of projects and you have to juggle through them. And at the end of it, you just really become good at administrative um, qualities and project management qualities, which can again be transferred to any other job, just not a research job. Ability to collaborate. Yes, this is important because scientific research seldom happens you know, in isolation. So a good scientific research happens from uh, scientists coming from various disciplines, sitting together and trying to look at a problem at different perspectives. And if you're doing a PhD, you'll also find yourself in such a situation where uh, different people from different disciplines are coming together and looking at one problem. In this way, it really inculcates a team building uh, exercise and um, your ability to collaborate with others and work with others increases exponentially. Leadership skills, yes. So like I mentioned before, there'll be other people who will be helping you in different like different aspects of your PhD project, but it is your research project, right? So you are the one who should be pulling it, leading it. And therefore, very naturally, you will uh, adapt and inculcate these leadership skills. Next is adaptability. This is a very important um, skill, no matter where you are. You need to adapt to this changing environment, changing research scenario, uh, changing skill requirement. So that's again, something which is again, very important. Accelerated learning, right? So let's say you're doing a research project in um, human neuroscience. So like I do, using uh, auditory and visual stimuli. Now, I don't have a lot of experience in auditory engineering, but to produce my stimuli, to uh, give the proper uh, kind of stimuli to my human subjects, I need to have certain amounts of auditory engineering expertise. And I had to learn that in a very limited amount of time. So these kind of skills, which are related to your research, but you have not done before, you have to learn and inculcate. You have to do it in a very small period of time. And this is also a very important skill. You have to look and uh, you have to pay attention to details in smallest to smallest things because a small change in your experiment can mean a huge thing for your uh, overall theoretical perspectives. And then so eventually you just learn to pay attention to these details. Critical thinking and analyses. Well, I don't think I have to uh, focus on this as much because when you are um, inquiring about something uh, which has not been done before, you need to have this critical thinking and um, these data analysis skills to make sense of what your data is and where to put it in the whole overall framework. So this is again, a very common exercise which PZ students uh, have to do on a daily basis. Last but not the least is writing proficiency and communication skills. Well, you've done all these research, collected all these data, have really nice results, but now you need to communicate it to the community, to the scientific uh, community as a whole and to general humankind. So for that, you need to develop writing proficiency because you ultimately need to publish papers and also go into conference and give talks. So as you keep doing it, you just becomes a natural habit to you um, these writing and communication skills. Now, these were some of the transferable skills, which are the so-called soft skills. There are again, uh, the hard skills like uh, data analysis skills or um, say programming skills, which are again, very specific to the kind of study you are doing. So uh, that again, you can transfer it to your next job if you don't want to remain in academia or a research setting. And um, these are some things which you can hope to gain while doing a PhD. 
One thing which a lot of people ask me who want to do a PhD is how to look for a PhD position because it can often come out to be very overwhelming. So much of information out there, so much of work to do, and um, a lot of people don't know wh what to look for, where to look for. So for that reason, I kept a very small um, slide with a few pointers, which actually helped me uh, uh, to you know, find a PhD position, and I would like to share them with you. So the most important thing, according to me, is before searching for a PhD position is to identify what you are really interested in. Because you'll be doing this for the next three to five years, and possibly even after that. And uh, therefore, it is really, really important that you are, you like this subject, you are interested in doing this for an extended period of time. And after you have identified that interest, uh, I would recommend you to start, start this PhD search really early because there are a lot of things you need to keep into consideration. First, there are different procedures for different countries. Like in India, you need to um, qualify in a few centralized exams conducted by uh, UGC, uh, such as UGC NET or GATE, etc. And only after that, you can um, be qualified to sit for a PhD interview. Similarly, in the US, if you want to do a PhD in the US, you need to look at different universities and different graduate schools and their criteria. You need to look at the strict application deadlines, because once you um, fail to met, meet those application deadlines, then you have to wait for the next year, which is, again, not desirable, and so on and so forth. Like again, like uh, for in uh, like in Europe, there are two kinds of PhD which you can do. So in Europe, uh, PhD is often seen as a full-time employment. So you can just apply as a job to a PhD with a few um, motivation letter or um, research statement, uh, recommendation letters, etc. And then there are again other types of PhDs which are uh, graduate school like PhDs, which are most common in the US. So you need to look at all these and decide where you want to apply, which is the best fit for you. Third, there is finding a supervisor in your preferred field. This will again take time because you need to find a person who does exactly what you want to do and who will also be a good fit for you to work with. Then there are again some PhDs which don't come with full funding. So you might need to apply for a scholarship for those, uh, for the, for those kind of PhDs. And those take time as well. So keeping all these things in mind, uh, you should really start your PhD uh, search early and way before uh, the deadlines. Along with these search, I would also recommend to talk to your professors and uh, other current PhD students because they are really the experts in the field and they would know uh, what to look for and where to look for. Some might even suggest you a good supervisor. So it's always a good um, thing to ask the experts in the field before going in their field. And last but not the least, I would say be prepared for rejection because the key here is to keep applying and not get demotivated because of a few rejections. Because rejections will come because a lot of people are applying and um, if you just apply to one or two places, the probability of you getting there will be slim. So just keep applying and uh, have a positive outlook. Next to the career and research opportunities after PhD. Well, of course you guessed it, the most common is academia. So after PhD, generally people go to work as a research scientist in a university or as a postdoc. Some people might also uh, opt for teaching at an undergraduate institution and um, then again, you can also apply for a faculty position directly, which might be a bit tough to get, but it's not, um, it's not uh, uncommon. Next is applying for a job in the industry. Like with these um, big companies starting research projects, it's not difficult to get a um, post as a research scientist at one of these companies in your field of interest. You can also uh, work as a business consultant, 
And I know a lot of PhD students have also started their own startups and become an entrepreneur. So these are things you can do after a PhD. Next, you can also apply in government sector. For example, work as a research scientist in government laboratories like ISRO or DRDO, or even work as an advisor to policymakers. And then there are other options like science communications and science journalism, and then whatever you wish to do. It, it won't really close any doors for you, PhD. It's just opening a lot of avenues. Now to go into a few misconceptions about PhD. Well, the first one is PhD can only lead to a career in academia. Well, I think this misconception probably I cleared in the previous slide and um, convinced you that PhD can lead to all sorts of career opportunities and not just academia and university research. Next is you should be in the lab all day and night. Yes, so this, this is a bad misconception that a PhD student is always in the lab doing their research, has no social life and so on and so forth. But that's not really true because you choose your time of work and often the deadlines are something which you set and you meet them. So it's not really uh, like that. Next is you must have completely new ideas to commence your research. Again, it is impossible to have completely new ideas to uh, start a research. What you'll do is build up on previous ideas and then find your way from it and then push it a bit forward. No one's asking you in your PhD to have like phenomenal work, like Nobel Prize worthy work. That's not generally the case. That doesn't happen. Next is, yes, this is also something which I heard a lot is that you think you're too old to start a PhD. Say if someone has worked in the industry for a few years and they have interest in going into research, but they think that they are too old to start a research at this age, but that's not true. I have seen people starting their PhD at age of 40 or 50 and doing really good at it. Um, my opinion on this is that it's never too late to start a PhD and uh, it's as long as you know what you are signing up for and what you are, what you are expecting from it, it's never too late. Now that I have uh, talked about the factual details of PhD and uh, what to expect from it, and hopefully cleared a few misconceptions, let's talk about a very important issue that is the gender gap in scientific career. Here we see a graph from the UNESCO for Women in Science uh, Forum published in 2017, which shows the increasing gender gap uh, in scientific research as um, with the increase in education level. So here at the high school level, we see that it's almost equal with a huge drop at the bachelor's level for scientific career. And then again, further drop at the PhD level, which keeps on dropping with only 11% of people at the top academic positions. And as we all know, only 3% of scientific Nobel prizes for women. Now, I would ask you to look at this graph really closely and see the problem here at the bachelor's and PhD level. We see that women consider like um, consistently um, that the number of women to um, pursue a scientific career at the bachelor's and PhD level is considerably lower than their male counterparts. And this is probably one of the reasons why the women, um, the number of women in tech companies are also quite low because the proper um, training and education is not completed here. And this can be attributed to a lot of societal and cultural stereotypes of uh, pursuing a scientific career for women. And uh, I think we need to change the mentality of uh, family and society as a general and teach people as to the capabilities of women and what they can bring to the table uh, as scientists or um, science educators. 
and I think there also needs to be robust government initiative to encourage women to actively participate and pursue science. And only then we can hope to bridge this huge gap between men and women in scientific career. With this, I come to the end of my presentation. I hope I could pick some interest in your mind about PhD and research in general. Do let me know if you have any questions. And thank you, thank you, PyCon India, for having me. Thank you, Ananya, for this wonderful session. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, I'll just be putting them up, uh, putting them up on the screen uh, in, in a bit. Okay, so we have one so far. Is there any list of universities or colleges for PhD? Any any ranking of colleges? A subsequent question. Yes. So uh, there are these two famous organizations which ranks universities. I think uh, one is the Times Higher Education uh, list, and the other is the QS University ranking list. So you can follow them and see which are the best um, universities around the world for the particular discipline that you would like to um, conduct your research in and then choose the university and the graduate school uh, from there. But my personal opinion would be to choose a proper lab first and then go for the university ranking because that is much more important than um, a overall university ranking. Thanks. Uh, I think this is an interesting one. So someone has anonymously asked, um, can you share your PhD interview experience? How many did you give and what is the success rate? Right. So, um, so I was mainly applying for my PhD in Europe and uh, mainly targeting Germany per se. So um, I, and in Germany, like I mentioned, there are two types of PhD. One is the graduate school type, which are quite few. Uh, and the majority of PhDs are um, advertised positions, like job positions. So like we need a PhD candidate and you can apply if you meet these criteria. So I was, I was applying for both of them. And um, well, the success rate actually is quite low, to be honest. Uh, and I, there is another way of applying for PhD as well, which is uh, directly emailing the supervisor with whom you would like to work and ask if they have a position. Uh, if they would like to supervise you. So that success rate is really, really low. So if you send 10 emails, you might get response from two. From them, one might say, OK, let's have an interview or so. That's the success rate you should be accustomed to. So for um, me, I applied to this graduate school, which had a two-step application procedure. First is I had to send all my documents along with a motivation letter, a cover letter, a small research statement, and recommendation letters. And um, if they like all these documents, then I would be qualified to the interview phase. So um, I qualified that. And the interview phase was a five part interview phase. Like I had to have interview with five professors and all of them should agree to take me to the graduate school. Uh, so that was a bit uh, scary for me because you have to convince five people together. But um, overall, I think what they are looking for is how much you know from your masters or bachelors and um, how much are you willing to put forward uh, to your PhD and whether you are a good fit for the lab. So just be yourself and don't try to um, convince them something which you are not. And I think it will be fine. I hope I answered all your questions. Uh, thanks, Ananya. I think uh, there's one more question which could be a follow up for this one as well. Uh, so it's like while applying for PhD, I was told it is better to initiate a conversations with the professor or mentor 
if they don't reply to your emails how how many times do you really pursue like three four times max yes i don't think you should uh, uh, pursue it uh, that uh, much because if, in my um, experience if a person is really having a resource uh, because you see to give you a position they need to have funding because you can't do a phd without um, a salary right it's not possible so um, if they have funding and if they think your profile fits with the lab they do uh, reply so um, maybe twice or three times max should be good um, to pursue after that you should really you know start applying to other places and uh, seek other professors as mentors great uh, thanks um, yeah um, so the next question is um, how do i prepare for uh, a phd interview um uh, well uh, so see the interviews at different places are uh, conducted very differently for example uh, what i heard from a few of my peers who were applying in india sometimes it uh, is very knowledge based like uh, you have to solve stuff like in front of the interviewers and um, you know from your masters level or your bachelors level for in my experience applying in europe it's mostly focused on my masters thesis like what work i did how i overcome any um difficulties that i had in those work and if i know all the technical specifications of my work so there it's really focused on um what i did and what i know rather than a uh, overall knowledge of the field right so it um, so preparation of an interview should be very focused on where you are in like um, sitting for the interview um, that would be my suggestion good thanks uh, since you brought up phd in india there's one question related to that uh, so what is your opinion about phd's in india um i what do you mean uh, opinion uh, well uh, for me i think phd's in india sometimes might take a bit longer um but there are really good research institutes in india where um, really robust research takes place like iscs iits and um the tifrs so um for doing phd in india you should really a phd in general you should really look at the lab what the output of the lab is and um, how the research environment of the lab is and that's all that matters to a phd thanks um there's another question on so angad gupta has asked uh, motivation and recommendation letters from industrialist uh, is is it acceptable while applying for your phd um so so the motivation letter is something which you need to write recommendation letters um i think graduate schools have the different graduate schools have the different uh, requirements uh for uh, who can write a recommendation letter often it's mostly people who are in academia that recommend you but um if you are in a industry setting where you did research or a research internship then those recommendations are also valid thanks uh, okay we are on the top of the hour uh, maybe we can take one last question and uh, then uh, uh, folks rest of uh, you can ask your question on the stage 5 tulip uh, stream ananya would be there hanging in uh, so just one last question uh, from Angasal bhi, uh, what are the prerequisites to do PhD in India? Uh, I mean, in terms of education. Right. So um, this depends on which subject you want to do a PhD in. For example, if you want to do a PhD in engineering, then a bachelor's degree with a good GATE score is often a um, bachelor's degree with, um, I think, seven GPA or something. It, it, um, varies from institution to institution but just a batch as in a btech plus a gate score 
is uh, good enough to um, qualify for a PhD. Of course, you need to crack the interview as well. For other subjects, say like um, neuroscience or uh, economics, those subjects, uh, I think a master's degree plus a UGC net qualification is important because uh, GATE or UGC net, these are the agencies which would be providing your PhD funding. So you need to qualify that to get a monthly stipend for your PhD. Good, thanks. Before we close the session, so a word of appreciation from Harpinder Singh. Uh, he says, thanks, Ananya, really appreciate the talk. Thanks, uh, thanks, Har Hardeep Singh. So thank you uh, all for joining this session.